Okay, so hello, I'm JJ Joaquin and welcome to Philosophy and What Matters, where we discuss things that matter from a philosophical point of view. Our topic for today is truth making. Now, it's true that two and two make four. It's also true that we are now in a philosophy interview. But what makes these things true? Now, according to Australian philosopher David Armstrong, Truths are made true by truth makers. But what are these truth makers and why do they matter? Now, in today's episode, we are privileged to have James Franklin, one of David Armstrong's most brilliant students. Professor Franklin is an honorary professor at the School of Mathematics and Statistics at the University of New South Wales. So, hello, Jim. Welcome to Philosophy and What Matter. Hi. Thanks for the invitation. Glad to be here. Okay, so before we get into Armstrong's main theory, I'd like to know your personal impressions of him. So, what were your first impressions of David Armstrong? What was he like as a philosopher? Uh, you can almost see this in the picture that he's a rather tall and dominating sort of personality. So, you certainly sat up and listened when he lectured, which he did in a rather slow and deliberative form. Uh, but immediately you realise that there was a powerful mind behind it and uh, very, one very concentrating on arguments for and against positions in a very fair way. He wasn't uh, polemical in the sense of uh, disparaging other views. He thought that uh, philosophy was really about putting the views for and against a position and just reaching a balance. I didn't always agree with what he said the first topic he lectured on us was Descartes' cogito and uh, I thought look he's got that all completely wrong uh, and uh, that of course as I was a mathematics student at the same time I wasn't used to that because in mathematics you don't say look the, the people have got it wrong it doesn't work like that philosophy I realized was different but nevertheless uh, Armstrong was a great introduction okay, so yeah, you, you have a personal connection with David Armstrong. But what's the history behind this picture? Why was Armstrong called the beast here? Yeah, the beast. This is the famous beast photo. This was the early 1970s when uh, University of Sydney, like many other Western universities, was convulsed by the wash-up of the 60s in left versus right fights. And Armstrong, as head of department, was very much to the right. And in this photo, He's, uh, he, it was, he'd invited a representative from the South Vietnamese consulate to mm -hmm. talk about uh, the Vietnam War, of course, from a right-wing perspective, and a radical student seized the microphone and started uh, abusing the speaker. And here Armstrong attempted to seize it back unsuccessfully, but a photographer caught exactly the right moment. And this uh, <laughs> photograph where Armstrong called the beast by everyone to the left of centre. It was commonly used to wallpaper left-wingers' walls around the Sydney in the 1970s. Uh, and shortly after that, uh, a left-wing uh, member of department, Mike Devon, who is now a distinguished philosopher in a style actually rather like Armstrong, mm -hmm. wrote uh, a, a, doc, a strategy document called Strategies to Isolate the Beast. <laughs> and uh, due to the efforts of the departmental secretary, it fell into the wrong hands and was read out in New South Wales State Parliament. So that really fixed the nickname, The Beast. <laughs> okay, so let me get it straight. There's a, a division in the University of Sydney Philosophy Department during that time, right? So do you have the right-wing people and the left-wing people, or the conservative yes. people and the liberal people? So what, what, uh, yes. what, yeah, so what caused that division? Uh, well, <laughs> it went back to... <laughs> Well, there was, all, there was always left versus right. I mean, it's, it's part of the human condition, left <laughs> versus right. But it had got worse in these days. Because left in those days didn't mean postmodernist like it means now. It meant pretty much Marxist-Leninist. Mm -hmm. and, uh, um, and there were divisions in Australia, especially over the Vietnam War. Uh, Australia sent troops to the Vietnam War and there was uh, angst about that, especially among students who were liable for conscription to it. Naturally, feelings ran high about that. So there were issues that were, well, off campus about war, but then on campus, there were issues about course content. So the, there was a very hard line 
Marxist-Leninist in Armstrong's department, Walt Suchty, who wanted to introduce courses on Stalin and Mao. <laughs> and uh, Armstrong and his uh, side of things uh, naturally dug in against that. So that was the issue at that time. And you have the feminists yeah. as well, right? On the other uh, side. Yeah, fem <laughs> the feminist issue came a little later than that, about a year after this, uh, this talk. Yeah, strangely, feminism was hardly invented <laughs> up to about 1972. And then all the, well, uh, I mean, it was, it was known in popular culture, but it wasn't seen much in academic circles until all of a sudden in 1973, mm. uh, there was a demand that uh, Mar a feminist course be taught, of course, from a sort of Marxist perspective at the University of Sydney Philosophy Department. And there was a strike and uh, um, tents on the quadrangle lawn, that sort of thing. And eventually it uh, did happen uh, against the uh, opposition of Armstrong and others. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Armstrong was more of the traditional philosopher than uh, more... Yeah, real. the traditional philosopher. So he thought that if you uh, entered, allowed flip political content to take over philosophy, that real philosophy uh, would no longer be able to be done. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, this is 45 years ago and we've seen what happened. Uh, so to some extent that has happened, and though to other extent the uh, traditional philosophy has found a place for itself and hasn't disappeared completely. Okay, so you're a philosopher and a mathematician, so you're also a historian of ideas and of Australian philosophy in particular, and a social advocate. So in what way did Armstrong influence your views on these matters? Well, he influenced my views in some of those matters and not others. Naturally, not on mathematics, which uh, he knew nothing about, uh, to put it bluntly, <laughs> and uh, not on social and ethical things either. Uh, Armstrong had a very naturalist view similar to his colleague uh, and friend John Mackey that mm -hmm. there was really no such thing as ethics uh, and uh, because in effect there's no truth makers for ethical truths there's nothing out there that would make ethical things true uh, well I don't uh, accept that position uh, my background is Catholic and I think there are things that provide truth makers for ethical truths in particular the worth of persons which is a in a, a, a serious and, and realist uh, aspect of persons. But where I, Armstrong did influence me positively was on um, Aristotelian realism about universals. So Armstrong thinks that uh, so reality includes not only individual things, but their properties like mass and charge, and that those are the things that science talks about. So that Newton's laws link uh, mass and gravitational force, for example, and that these are about the real properties of things. Well, I was influenced by that and wrote an Aristotelian realist philosophy of mathematics, which extended that theory to a philosophy of mathematics. Yeah, so we will discuss that later. But for now, let's go to Armstrong's main idea. So what is truth making all about? So as I understand it, Truth making theory has three theses. So you have truth maker maximalism, that every truth has a truth maker. Uh, truth maker necessitarianism, necessarily if a truth maker exists, then some proposition is true. And finally, the entailment uh, principle. If some truth maker makes true a proposition, then if that proposition entails another proposition, then that truth maker is the truth maker for the entailed proposition. So let's try to understand these things one by one. What does he mean by truth making in the first place? Yeah, so let's get back to something more simpler, uh, more simple, and maybe understand what this kind of theory contrasts with. So yeah, the, the phrase truth, truth supervenes on being is a good one. The idea is uh, being first, what's out there, and truth, uh, beliefs, uh, anything to do with language and um, the mentor comes second and has to agree with that. So out there, uh, there's uh, uh, so many elephants and in the world of propositions or thought or beliefs, there's the statement that there are so many elephants and the elephants come first. And even if there'd been no people, no thinking, no statements, no language, mm -hmm. 
the elephants being the way they are, being, is solid. And the truth has to agree with that. And that's what the idea is truth super genes on being. It contrasts with theories that you might call linguistic idealism, like those of Derrida, most famously, who seem to think of language as freestanding and not pinned down somehow by being. They are inclined to say that language exists by itself and you can't get beyond it or see through it to being. Well, that's not, that's got things, that's got the wrong end of the stick, you know, uh, being first. Okay, so what, what does it mean by the idea that every truth has a truth maker? Yeah, it means that uh, if there's a truth, a proposition or an individual belief uh, that's true, for it to be true, there's got to be something out there that makes it true. Well, of course, it could, if the proposition itself is about in here, like what I'm thinking, then the truth maker is in here as well. Mm -hmm. But normally, if you're talking about a truth like uh, there are seven there are 8 billion people on earth. Well, what makes that true is uh, the 8 billion people out there. And uh, that comes first, the truth and the knowledge of it, or anything to do, that, anything to do with the, the mental or linguistic world mm. supervenes on it, that just sits on top of it, uh, is caused, caused is quite not necessarily the right word, um, comes second and uh, is dependent on it, ontologically on it. Is that the idea of the necessitarianism? So necessarily, if there's a truth maker, you have some proposition that's made true by that truth maker. Is that the thing going on? Uh, yeah, so that depends a bit on your view of propositions. It could be that, it could be that uh, there are facts about the distant universe that nobody's ever thought of. And uh, if you think propositions are somehow mentally dependent, then you would think there is no such proposition. In that case, there's no proposition to do the supervening on the being. On the other hand, if you think of propositions as a kind of Platonist entity that must exist, then uh, they then for every truth, then for every uh, aspect of being, if that's the word, there will be a proposition expressing it. Well, that's a that's a as you and I have discussed, the theory of propositions is itself very difficult. Right. Uh, and the truth maker theory tries to leave those things aside and look, concentrate on the being aspect and thinks, uh, well, of course, there's got to be a philosophy of propositions and tr what the kind of things that are true, but we'll kind of leave that um, for, for the moment. Actually, there is in Armstrong's book, Truth and Truth Makers, there is a serious chapter about propositions and the nature of them which uh, reviewers thought was the least successful, I think. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, difficult questions, but they're not quite what truth maker theory is about. So they must be solved, really. Okay, so how about this uh, entailment principle? So I'll give you an example. So uh, Jim is a philosopher, and it's made to by your existence, but that entails that someone is a philosopher. So your existence, also makes that true, that someone is a philosopher? Uh, yes, that's right. So to, to take uh, existential propositions, uh, the, the proposition there is an elephant is mm -hmm. made, has lots of truth makers. Any elephant being what it is, is enough to make that true. And if some of the elephants disappeared, but not all of them, well, uh, it would still be true. There'd still be a truth maker for it. So we shouldn't, take the singular in truth makers as uh, uh, too literally and we shouldn't think perhaps that there's a one-to-one -one relation exactly mm. between truths and truth makers so um, yeah in in that case an existential proposition anything being that true anything being an elephant well is, is enough to make there is an elephant true okay so what are these truth makers are they facts or states of affairs or abstract objects? Uh, according to Armstrong, and I think rightly, states of affairs is the right answer. So what makes the table, the proposition, the table is, this table is round true, is the actual tables being round, which is a state of affairs. It's the way the table is out there in the real world. The word facts is sometimes used 
to mean the same as states of affairs, but it's unfortunately ambiguous, I think. Sometimes when you say facts, you mean truths, and sometimes you mean states of affairs. So it's just better to leave, uh, leave that word aside. And they're certainly not abstract objects either. <laughs> well, according to Armstrong, there aren't any abstract objects. He's an anti-Platonist. Mm. But if there were, they wouldn't be the right kind of things to be truth makers of something like there is an elephant. For the truth makers of there is an elephant, what you want is elephants, not abstract abstractions. No, that's right. Okay, so why do these truth makers matter? In our thinking, in our metaphysics? And oh, in our thinking, well, uh, yeah, why does it matter? Because you, you need to understand in each case what it is. If you're doing science, well, you need to, you've got theories, you need to understand what it is for those to be true, what counts, what you've got to go and look for to, to, to observe perhaps to make it true. Uh, if uh, you think your proposition is that God exists, well, you need to know what it is. Do you, do you, uh, you've, got to, you've got to explain uh, what kind of thing God is uh, that, would, that would make that a truth maker. And uh, yeah, especially maybe with ethics, whether it's, it's quite hard to say. Mm -hmm. If you think your obligation is to uh, uh, help the poor or something, what is it that makes that true? Well, uh, if you don't have an answer to that, you might be unmotivated to do it. It's the philosopher's job to say why it does matter to um, help the poor or whatever. Okay, so we're touching on some of the problems with Armstrong street making theory. So let's go there. So one problem is about general truths. So how does Armstrong hunt for a truth like all dogs are mammals? Well, uh, that one is probably a necessary truth, and it's about the way the, the universal dog, about what it is to be a dog. But the, when he he's talks about universal truths, I think he's thinking more of a, what he calls a, uh, a, 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 a universal state of affairs uh, uh, or nothing. But um, So the statement that there are only... Well, that the eight billion people on Earth are all the all the people that there are. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of statement that is thought to be a, a problem. What is what is it that makes that true that uh, there aren't any more people? Uh, that that's all there are. Well, um, that's not so easy to describe exactly, but it has to be a fact about the whole universe that you go around the universe and you see where the people are. Mm -hmm. They're on Earth. There aren't the whole. You, you look at all the people. They're all on Earth, and they add up to eight billion. Well, we can we've described the way the world is, and I think that's sufficient to say what the truth maker of of that truth is. The truth that the only that all the people there are are those eight billion. Yeah, but that implies a kind of negative fact, right? So here that's right. Yeah. yeah. It's a negative fact, like there aren't any people except on Earth. And that is a, that is a, a very a sort of ambit or big claim, and it's a claim about the whole universe, the same as there aren't any unicorns. There are no unicorns. So that is, uh, in a sense, not a fact about unicorns. It's a fact about the whole universe and its whole lot of contents. It says if you got the whole, if you got the whole, universe in front of you, counted all the objects and list and classified them, well, there are each for each one, it's not a unicorn. It's something else. Okay. So it's a very diffuse sort of truth maker. Mm -hmm. And Armstrong admits that and says it looks a bit more um, up in the air or you might say abstract, but uh, harder to grasp than uh, a statement like this is an elephant. The elephant's there, and it's got its properties, and you, you, you can observe it. You're really in touch with that. But a statement like there are no unicorns is very different. It's a statement about the whole universe. Uh, well, that's uh, how it is. Uh, you still have a good, a good grasp of what it is that would make that true and false. What would make it true is, is that of all, for all the elements, the things in the universe, there's something other than a unicorn, and what to make it false is a unicorn. Okay, how about... You, you, still grasp, you still grasp how truth supervenes on being, 
mm. even in a even though it's a rather 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 not not a, not so close a relationship as in the examples we first thought of. Okay, so how about temporal sentences? How are they true? Like, I had breakfast this morning, and I will go to to this to the uh, yes, the, the past. Well, it's in one sense, it's not the business of truth maker theory to solve all problems mm -hmm. in other areas of philosophy, like the philosophy of time. However, uh, you could perhaps give a sketch. One possibility, and I don't uh, necessarily agree with this, is that. Uh, uh, growing block theory like uh, Peter Forrest um, defends, mm -hmm. according to that, the past exists, but the future doesn't. So the past, uh, it's, it's kind of like, a, as it says, a growing block, there's a kind of edge to it that moves forward like weaving a carpet. So the past is left behind and it's solidly existing in some sense, it's for the philosophers of time to say exactly what sense, and that makes truth makers of past things. But the future doesn't exist at all, and strictly speaking, there aren't um, truth makers of future contingent statements like the sun will rise tomorrow. Mm -hmm. They're not statements, they're predictions, which are not strictly true or false. Uh, Aristotle has some suggestions, something like that, uh, predictions about them can be uh, reliable or unreliable. Uh, there's reasons to think that the prediction that the sun will rise tomorrow is reliable, but it's still, strictly speaking, not a truth, and there's no truth maker for it. Well, it's a theory, but it's uh, not really for truth maker theory to uh, uh, evaluate that. Mm. So you're talking about moral facts as well. So there's some moral truths, and according to truth making theory, if those are true, then there should be a truth maker. Are you going for that position as well? Uh, yes, and uh, Armstrong, I think, thought that uh, there was no possible truth maker for that. So although he didn't really go on about it uh, in public very much, he really thought there's no ethical truths. Mm -hmm. Though he was certainly uh, capable of being very uh, dogmatic about uh, <laughs> uh, politico-ethical truths uh, right. about what the left should do with itself. Nevertheless, uh, I would say that there are um, a truth, a solid truth makers for ethical truths, and most of them are the, the worth of persons, that the way people are with consciousness, uh, rationality, uh, emotions and so on, means that their worthwhileness, their importance, significant, moral significance, absolutely speaking, supervenes on that. That uh, just being that way, uh, a rational, conscious person, means that it matters absolutely what happens to you. And hence, uh, obligations to uh, not to murder you, for example, or to assist your education, uh, follow from that, supervene on it in the ordinary sense. Okay, so I reckon that a robust truth-making theory implies some metaphysics that is a complete picture of reality. I think that Armstrong's philosophical views are informed by this commitment as well, the truth makers. So is, is this a right assessment of the relationship between truth making and metaphysics, a complete picture of reality? It is, it is, but it doesn't imply any very definite uh, philosophical position. It certainly rules out the linguistic idealism in the style of Derrida, as I was saying. Mm -hmm. uh, but it would be compatible, for example, Platonism. So if your theory was that there are a lot of abstract objects like propositions and uh, numbers and sets, you could think in, as a truth maker theorist that truths about meaning and mathematics supervene on those. Armstrong didn't think that, but because he was anti-Platonist and all he is a much more naturalist theory, uh, theorist. So his idea of what the truth makers are is much more naturalist. But so in that sense, it, truth maker theory implies a realist attitude that, uh, well, truth supervenes on being, the being is first, but which, what view you have of being could vary quite a lot. Okay, let's go to your view. So in the philosophy of mathematics, you defend a view called yeah, as she called it a while ago, an Aristotelian realist philosophy of mathematics. Now, according to your view, uh, mathematics is about the structure of reality. 
Is your view somehow influenced by Armstrong's truth-making theory here? Yes, and perhaps more definitely by his truth-making theory as realized in an Aristotelian realist theory of universals. Mm -hmm. So he thinks science is about universals like mass, charge, and length. And that my view is that mathematics is also about universals which are realized in the real, real world like uh, well, shape, size, uh, uh, length, but perhaps uh, the central example is ratio. Mm. So, uh, for example, the, you're a certain height and I'm a certain height, which is slightly different. And that means that uh, what supervenes on that is the ratio of our heights. And if you and I were standing next to each other instead of thousands of kilometres apart, the viewers would be able to see immediately the ratio of our heights approximately. So ratio is very typically studied by mathematics mm -hmm. and it's, um, it's out there, it's observable, it affects our senses. In fact, this, our senses, especially vision, and uh, I guess hearing as well, are, are very set up to um, register to complexes of universals, uh, complex uh, patterns of ratios. Mm -hmm. But that's assuming that these universals are real things in the world, right? That's right. Well, it isn't assuming it. It's, I'm telling you, you can see it. You can see, <laughs> you can see ratio. Mm -hmm. uh, so if, for example, you have a tall, thin person next to a short, fat person, you can immediately see, your vision is set up to immediately see the, mm -hmm. the, the ratio of height to width is different. Okay, so... There's a good reason, yeah. Right. You see that. So I'm trying to make sense of that. So there are patterns and structures in reality that make some mathematical truths true. For example, the ratio that you have been talking about, geometric truths as well, and perhaps some truths in calculus, for example, are made true by things in the world, right? How about yes. some, some other truths, like truths about infinity, truths about higher order mathematics, modular forms and so on? Uh, yes, well, uh, I would say that, that is certainly uh, the most difficult problem for Aristotelian realist philosophies of mathematics. Um, it's, it, you need some theory of uninstantiated universals, mm -hmm. and Armstrong worked hard on that and I think was never totally happy with his answer. It would help, I think, if we, uh, instead of thinking about infinities that are beyond our ken somewhat, we thought about a simple example, the one of Hume, about a missing shade of blue. Mm -hmm. Suppose that there are lots of shades of blue, but there is one shade of blue that, by complete coincidence, is not realised in the real world. Now, what about the science of colour? Does it deal with that shade of blue or doesn't it? Well, I think you would say yes, that it's the business of science to deal with universals and their necessary relations, like it's a necessary truth about colours, for example, that orange is between red and yellow. Mm. Well, you can study that without having to worry about whether some particular shade of blue or orange happens to be not realised. You need some input from the real world to get the idea of colour. But having done that, you realise that colour comes on a spectrum and that that spectrum is in principle continuous mm. and that it's just a matter for the real world to decide uh, which things are realised. But on one numbers, I wonder if we could think instead of infinities of a much, what if the world was a lot smaller? Mm -hmm. suppose, that, suppose that there are only six things in the world, like, uh, say God and five angels. Now what about the truth seven plus five is 12? Mm -hmm. Is it true in that world or isn't it? Well, I would say yes. And it's an unrealised possibility. If it, it says that if, you, if that world did expand, like some, some more things were created, like atoms, mm -hmm. they must conform to 7 plus 5 is 12, even though at the moment there aren't any 7 or 12 realised. So you know, I would actually I would defend that what I call a semi-Platonist Aristotelian realism of uninstantiated, real, uninstantiated universals, such as an uninstantiated shade of blue or something, Mm -hmm. that says that they're, unlike Platonism, they're the kind of things that could be realised in the world, though it may happen by coincidence that they're not. So are these 
uninstantiated universal merely possible or possible? Well, it's merely possible. Well, it, it's merely. <laughs> I don't like the phrase, phrase really, merely. Uh -huh. uh, it's possible, and it's possible by, uh, by a constraint on the way the world could expand. Mm -hmm. It's just the way colours are that they're uh, the, the, state, the space of colours, meaning the space of possible colours, is the way it is and has a certain structure. And you can learn about that to some extent from observing the colours that happen to be realised. Mm. But, there's, but a, the statements about it are not contingent. The statement, a statement like orange is between red and yellow is not contingent. It's, ne it's a necessity. And that world of necessities imposes its will, so to speak, on the actual world. And it's the business of mathematics and the science of colors to understand those necessities. Okay, so yeah, I think you have an idea about perceiving necessities in the world as well, right? So what is that about? Uh, yes, that's right. Uh, you can, I would say you can sometimes perceive necessities. Mm -hmm. uh, it'd be better if we had a picture, but I think I can ask people to um, do it in their mind's eye. Suppose you have a row of three dots and below that aligned with them another row of three dots. So you have two threes, two threes, which is six. Now mentally rearrange them so that there's three columns of two. So there's uh, the left-hand column, the middle column of two, the right-hand column of two. Mm -hmm. Well, it's the same six objects. So you can actually see that two multiplied by three equals three multiplied by two. And you can see that it must be that because it's the same six objects. So your, your visual facility, and I'm meaning the, the eyes themselves and the uh, pro intellectual processing behind it can see that necessity. Okay, so... Well, on a more personal note, you were a student of some of the best philosophers we have in the 20th century. We have Armstrong, David, Ar David Stove, who was your uh, main teacher, John Mackey, etc. So why did you pursue philosophy as your academic career? Why mathematics? Uh, <laughs> in, to some extent, it was because I had talent in it and to make sure I got a job. <laughs> so I... At, uh, I, uh, at the beginning of my mathematics, uh, at the beginning of my undergraduate career, at the end of school, mm -hmm. I did very well at mathematics. And uh, my motivation for mathematics was not quite 100%, and in fact, not quite enough mm -hmm. for a really serious career in it. And at that stage, I knew nothing about philosophy. I, couldn't, I, said, I thought to myself, I don't understand where philosophy fits into them scheme of things. I know what biology is about the animals and the mathematics is about numbers. What the hell is philosophy about? <laughs> and I, to, to pick up an extra subject, I just enrolled in philosophy one to see, well, well, it's abstract. I thought I love abstract mm -hmm. things. I'll find out what it's about. So it turned out to be uh, good and to have, and I was motivated to do it. I could have, I could have attempted a career just in that. Uh, it was dangerous to do that. And, uh, perhaps largely to get a job, but also I did enjoy the pure mathematics. I gained a PhD in algebra mm -hmm. and did a little work further in certain areas of mathematics. Mathematics is, is very interesting, yeah. It is, it, because, and part of, part of the reason is that, it, as Plato says, it keeps you in touch with necessities. Mm -hmm. I don't think you're going to become a Derridean postmodernist <laughs> if you're a mathematician because uh, you understand that the truth, what the truth makers are for the necessity of mathematical truths. You're not going to be sucked into linguistic idealism, no way. So, uh, and I was also became interested in mathematical modeling, which is how mathematics applies to, uh, to uh, for example, climate science. What, what it is about uh, the surface of the earth and the motions of the currents at uh, mathematical science gets a hold of and what does it tell you about uh, the world over and above what uh, what um, just the science tells you physics 
Mm -hmm. But I'm still hearing the Armstrong truth-making theory in your mathematics, in, in your way of doing mathematics. You would say that, yes. I, although I did pure math, specialized in pure mathematics, I always felt that pure mathematicians weren't telling me what it was for, mm -hmm. and uh, that there should be a path that you could, the student could take back to seeing what in the real world it connected with. So, for example, group theory is uh, at the core of abstract algebra, but also it's the correct classification of symmetry. And symmetry is, uh, like ratio, one of the basic mathematical properties of the real world. Mm -hmm. You can see whether my face is symmetrical or not. And if it isn't, it, you'll say that guy shouldn't become a politician because it looks bad on television. <laughs> Your, yes, symmetry is very visually prominent, mm -hmm. which is why it's such a big thing in art. But at the same time, it's a mathematical property and the core of modern abstract algebra. Yeah, but the philosophy still is about the real world. So maths is about the real world. Art is a, well, some art will be part of the real yes, world. Yes, that's right. I've, and the history of ideas, uh, it's, I've, proved, I've found it very hard to settle down and do one thing. Absolutely. <laughs> and I don't, I don't recommend that to the young people of today because it's hard to make a career doing lots of different things. I'm sorry, but specialization, at least in early years, is, uh, mm. seems to be what's called for to get a career. Okay, so speaking of a lot of interest, one of the main influences, well, one of the main things that influenced me to pursue this really is your book, Corrupting the Youth. Uh, for those who don't know, uh, uh, Jim here authored or written the history, an opinionated history of Australian philosophy corrupting the youth. So what inspired you to write that book? Uh, I was inspired at, at, by remembering at school when we studied Thucydides' history of the Peloponnesian War. Mm -hmm. And he said, Unlike other philosophers, uh, other historians, I'm going to write the history of my own time. Mm -hmm. So I was there on the front line at the philosophy strike and Armstrong versus the, 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 the anti-beast people, and <laughs> Marxists, and uh, it was an exciting time. And I realised later that uh, the philosophy as well was uh, exciting and had an interesting history. So I knew some of those people. I put them to the foreground, but there were plenty of other philosophers as well. Philosophy makes for good history, unlike mathematics. You can't, I think, write an exciting story about the history of mathematics in Australia, but philosophers are, well, shall we say, the point of philosophy, part of the, philosophy has conflict, which mathematics doesn't, like in sitcoms uh, and uh, um, thrillers, conflict makes for a good story. And the human mind is not quite well adapted to getting the truth in mm -hmm. philosophy. So people have crazy views and opposite crazy views and they're at each other's throats. Of course it makes a good story, so I wrote it. Yeah, so for those who, well, purchased the book, Corrupting the Youth, it's a really fun read. So finally, yeah, I had the privilege of learning from you and learning how to really excel in academic work through our many interactions throughout many, years. What's your advice to people who are starting their careers in academia or in philosophy? Yeah, that's not easy to say. I'm glad I'm not trying to do it myself today because I would feel under pressure to write technical and complicated articles to get a citation profile and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it, philosophy really needs to be more of a vocation as well, even though you have to do those things. Uh, so you don't ask, you, it's crazy to think of going back and asking Socrates how his uh, citation profile was going. Yeah. You know, that wasn't what it was about. He didn't, wasn't in it for the career. Mm -hmm. But still, as we say in moral philosophy, you've got to eat. And at the moment, you have, the way to do it is to concentrate on something. You've got to find something that's interesting to yourself. And that's not just uh, an off cut from what your supervisor has got in his bottom drawer or something. You have got to find something that you're passionate about deciding. And then, well, you just have to imitate how the experts do it and get published. Mm -hmm. Not much more I can say about that. 
Uh, you could consider, like I did, getting a job somewhere else, like teaching mathematics or something, and doing philosophy as well. Uh, so that might work for some, depending on your skills and talents. Okay, so is this career worth it? For some it is, for some it isn't. How about for uh, you? Some people, uh, and I, it, worked, it worked for me. <laughs> I had some luck uh, from time to time. Well, I had some luck in having mathematical skills that would get me a job teaching mathematics pretty much no matter what, because uh, that, that it, it's, a good, um, it's a good career prospect because there's a shortage of people in mathematics with mathematical skills. So I was lucky that I could do that and then do what I felt like. So the first thing I felt like was a book about the history of probability before Pascal. Mm -hmm. So it has mathematical connections, but really it's about things like the law of evidence. Well, I just, who's, I just got into that and I decided this is an interesting topic. I wrote the book, it was quite successful. Who knows whether anybody is going to have that luck. It, it, well, it worked for me, but I don't necessarily advise everybody else to do the same. You have to, you have to look at the situation and see what the prospects are. Okay. So I think that's enough for now. Thanks, Jim, for sharing your time with us. And join me again. Many thanks. Join me again for another episode of Philosophy and What Matters, where we talk about things that matter from a philosophical point of view. Thanks. Thanks.